Let's go out front. And good evening, I'm Erin Burnett. Out front tonight, no holding back. Vice President Kamala Harris calling out Trump, saying that his hateful words are to blame for the divide in America. Now, Vance obviously putting the blame for violence squarely on Harris. And in the past 24 hours, he has chosen a very specific and important word to focus on. Listen to it. Fascist. So it, it's an interesting word to highlight, as he did and emphasize, because what Vance did not mention is that one person who loves to, quote, call one candidate a fascist is the man on the top of his ticket, Donald J. Trump. He does it in speech after speech after speech. You got it? Words do matter this election. We know that. And Trump's carry great weight. We're now learning, in fact, that the FBI is investigating suspicious packages sent to election officials in more than 12 states. That's actual packages coming threatening election workers. And still, even as that news broke, Trump posted this online, quote, caps when I... All right, Kristen Holmes, thank you very much. And of course, uh, we're, we're watching the former president when he does address uh, the uh, assassination attempt. If he does, we're going to make sure you hear that. Uh, all right, everyone's here with me now as, as we're waiting to see what happens here. Philip, let me start with you. Um, it is very clear, and this is interesting, Kamala Harris is not saying... She did. She she expressed horror at the political violence. She did right. all of the right things. But she is not saying, OK, I'm going to back off on calling out what how I see it. Right. right? She's calling out his hateful uh, rhetoric and saying that he cannot be entrusted to stand behind the seal of the United States. Right? right. She's not backing off at all with what she believes is at stake, even in light of a second assassination attempt. And that's pretty significant. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's someone, well, of course, you can say that if you actually think that they are a fascist who is trying to take over American democracy, which a lot of Democrats believe. And of course, the other reason that Kamala Harris is unlike all that equating uh, Trump as a victory as a threat to democracy in and of itself. Trump's team is trying to say that that in and of itself is stoking violence against Trump. Yeah, well, there's no evidence that it's stoking violence against Trump. It's a political rhetoric that's been going on for a long time. Frankly, the Democrats have been saying this almost as long as Donald Trump mobsters attacked an American institution, attacked the Congress, attacked police, all the people who are attacking America. But I think Kamala Harris wants to hold them responsible. David, I'm curious, and I, it, it, and I asked you this question just, just for a moment, on the Republican side, right? Well, they are pointing fingers at Kamala Harris and, and others, right? They say for stoking this violence. At the very least, David, let me ask you this. Why are Republicans failing to take any blame themselves? There's a lot of finger pointing. There's not a lot of ownership of anything uh, either way. But on the Republican side, why does nobody own up to a lot of the things that have been said and done have not been good and have been involved with violence? All right, so hold on a second. I'm glad because I don't want to go relitigate all of January 6th. I know you'd love to jump in on it, Jamal. I'm just going to move past it for a moment. Well, I'm just laughing because, because she sat for a long time today. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, let's just listen. You want to? Okay, let's listen into Trump on this town hall because he's talking about the auto industry. What he said about the call, though, and I, I just want everyone to know, what he said is that Kamala Harris called him, the vice president. And he said it was a very nice call. That's what he said. Crowd boot. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I understand it's a political rally, but yeah. this is the moment we're in, right? You can't even say that somebody called me when I was someone attempted to assassinate me. My my rival called, and it was a nice call. Trump says that, mm -hmm. and they boo. Yeah, I mean, what this makes me think of is uh, last night in a speech in Georgia, J.D. Vance encouraging people and saying that hit Trump and Vance simply because Americans are so divided and there's so much partisan division. And I think that's what you see there. I mean, I think that in this moment, it doesn't necessarily matter who it will drew on either side of the aisle. I, I am curious, though, Jamal, it, it, and I'm just, let's just take aside who's more to blame or the fact that January 6th came first means Repo at this moment, when you say talk, call out hateful rhetoric, as, as Harris did in a very calm way. But is it, does it really help anybody? I mean, you know, her, her choir already knows and hears what she's saying. Yeah. Is there any benefit to it now? Yeah, I mean, you know, on this point, Phil's probably right. Democrats wouldn't have taken it very great if Donald Trump's name came up at a Democratic rally. That's what happens when you're in the last... Right, the booze could have gone election. both ways. Yes, anyway. yes. But what usually happens when we have a moment like this is everybody back to Springfield and this issue about what's happening with the migrants there... We know the vice president will continue to say the same things. So the person who's in charge of creating order in the country, the president, a job back. And I just think that that's a very dangerous and unfortunate development. Uh, David, Vance was asked today about Trump going to Springfield, right? To the, the Trump has been wanting to go to Springfield, okay? Here's what Senator Vance said. 
Philip, I mean, okay, I understand what David's saying, but in a sense, you know, Trump threw a grenade in a room. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then everyone's being criticized for talking about the explosion. Right. Yeah, I mean, two things I'd say. The first is that the issuance, this is a issue, a campaign issue, someone making those threats in Springfield, that's very, very important to cover. I just say lastly, I have a suspicion Donald Trump knows he can't win on the issues. Donald Trump has an advantage on the economy. David wants to talk about the economy <laughs> a lot. He has an advantage on the economy. Tonight, the words J.D. Vance didn't want anyone to see. A K-File investigation uncovering an essay that Vance wrote in 2012, slamming Republicans on immigration. Say it again, slamming Republicans on immigration. An essay Vance asked a former professor to delete when he decided to run for office as a Republican. Now, the professor did delete it, but our K-File found it anyway. And in it, Vance writes, quote, Republic Okay, there's one very clean operative quote. Uh, what else did you find in this essay that J.D. Vance had requested his professor to delete? The professor did delete and J.D. Vance thought was gone. Yeah, J.D. Vance eviscerated the Republican Party in this blog post. He attacked their position on women, minorities. But take a look here at what J.D. Vance wrote about deportation. Okay, that's clear. Let's look yep. at what he said about how he viewed the GOP and how other people viewed the GOP. He said, uh, the, you know, you cannot nominate people comments about rape in a 2012 Senate race and lost by six points uh, as a Republican in Indiana. Um, this is incredible. But talking about the, the very policy that Trump but deporting, right? As, as you point out at the center, it fails to pass a laugh test. The same can be said for mu too much of the party's platform. Okay. So now I understand why he might want this scrubbed from the internet. Um, and, he, and he did. He, he asked his professor to uh, delete it and they did. So it got deleted, and yet you found it. Um, I, I, you don't have to share how if you don't want to, but how difficult was it for you to find it? It was actually not very difficult. He wrote in his book, had, had raised him. So we searched, actually, uh, for posts that were, we saw that there were three previously that had been shared by the think tank, uh, but only two of them were still online. And then I looked, and the other one was called a blueprint for the geo. I was able to find the entirety of this post, which it seems like he hid because of realizing that these views. And interesting that he thought it was deleted. Well, I'm glad everybody can see it because it's important for people to know this information. Um, you know, to this, there's more where this came from. This is important because it's policy. But when he's talked about Trump, we know he'd been critical about Trump. His yeah. whole thing has been talking about how he, he woke up and realized he was going to change his mind about Trump. But you have found more and more instances where he has been highly critical of Trump. Mm -hmm. Things that we have not seen before, including one new example. What is it? Yeah, and what's really interesting. Uh, no, you know one would ever think that anybody who had said all of these things would be Trump's vice presidential uh, nominee and choice, and yet here we are. This is important for everyone to see. All right, Andrew Krasinski of K-File, thank you. Also new tonight, Trump squanders $15 million. This is money loaned to him from his dad who bailed him out. Two Pulitzer Prize winning reporters from the New York Times uncovering a trove of secret business records and tax returns, which show never before known reasons why Trump is so sensitive to questions about his wealth. Russ Putner and Suzanne Craig are now out front uh, right now. So, all right, I I've spoken to each of you over the years. This is an incredible uh, reported piece of work that you are now releasing for everyone to see. So, you reveal Trump's father. Fred repeatedly bankrolled his son. And then we know, you know, he had been given money, but you guys document all the different ways it happened, including a $15 million loan, Ross, that you revealed Donald Trump never paid back. 15 million. Tell me more. So that was to help him with the construction of the money. So that was actually an illegal tax return. They somehow converted that 50 loss that right. reduced his income on another building. All right, so that's fraud on one level. Mm -hmm. On another very basic level, that's Trump taking $15 million and turning it into zero, uh, which is another thing that goes totally against the entire ethos and brand that, that he's put out there, Suzanne. You know what I found fascinating about this as well, though, is you know you, you lay all this out, but you also talk about how you know, he talks about he's this real estate mogul. Right. And yet, and that's actually how you know he gets The Apprentice. And yet it turns out from your reporting, The Apprentice, that the, you, you got tax returns, you got confidential business documents that no one's ever seen before that reveal he got, what, $400 million from The Apprentice. That, that could be his biggest success. It's, it's incredible. When we look at the title is Lucky Loser because he lived a life, he was born lucky, but there was Donald Trump. So he was sort of not doing well and Mark Burnett tapped him for the show and that they, Mark Burnett would get the product placements money. So there's a Coke can on the table. If Coca-Cola has paid for that, Mark Burnett gets the money. And this happens and it becomes, I mean, more than $400 million. I mean, it's impossible to truly kind of comprehend that, right. what that happened. You know, Russ, and yet as part of this, the big event, right, on The Apprentice was who's gonna get fired, right? So 
tune in to see who's going to get fired each week. Uh, it was moments like this. Who learned that Trump was so unpredictable with who he was going to fire and that it was not based on sort of how they performed. They were tasks. I remember judging some of these tasks. You know, you, it, and there were, it, this is, it was supposed to be who did the worst on the tasks. But that he sometimes would be so bad about his choice about who he fired that they'd have to go back and edit it to make that person look bad. That's exactly right. The first face you show on the whole gauntlet. But Trump fired him on like the very first episode. And people in the control and producers were like, oh my God, what do we do with this now? Trump would call reporters. This is something I've been just fascinated by over the years. This kind of alter ego bizarre right, thing right. when he would pretend to be a guy named John Barron. Right. And he would do it when he was talking about affairs or about, um, you know, how rich he was because he wanted people to think he was richer than he was and get put on the Forbes list and all of these things. He'd pretend to be this guy, John Barron. Here's one conversation that was recorded. I mean, he didn't even try to use a voice changer, which a six-year-old would try to do. It's even very even clearly Donald John Trump. Barron. So I, oh, my gosh. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. But you discovered a long and bizarre history to John Barron. And by the way, the Barron Trump may be part of it, too. But the history is something else. Well, we, we, we've always sort of wondered why John Barron. And we found out in the book that John Barron was selling it. So it was just this crazy origin story of John Barron that we've always wondered where it came from. And we found it in the classified ads of newspapers, old newspapers in New York. That history. Yeah. And as you point out, that his, his son happens to uh, also have that right. name. All right. Well, thanks so much. As I said, it's always such a pleasure to talk to both of you with your incredible reporting and this book, Lucky Loser, out uh, today uh, by Russ and Suzanne. And next, the breaking news. We are learning that Israel was behind the thousands of exploding pagers that were being used by Hezbollah operatives. Nearly 3,000 people injured or killed as of this hour. We'll tell you what we know about it. And live pictures as former President Jimmy Carter is celebrating his 100th birthday. His grandson joins me with what Carter is most hoping for right now. Breaking news, Trump moments ago at his rally in Michigan, giving new details about the assassination attempt on Sunday. Here's what he said. All right, uh, talking there about uh, the witness uh, that he says was a woman who saw uh, the shooter get in that car. We do know that security is ramped up at Trump's event tonight following this incident where he is, of course, he is now in Flint, Michigan. And finally tonight, Jimmy Carter turning 100. You're looking at live pictures of the theater where his 100th birthday celebration kicked off moments ago in Georgia, Carter's home state, of course. The longest living president in U.S. history, Carter will officially turn 100 on October 1st. All right. Well, Jason, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks so much to all of you for joining us. AC360 starts now.